talking with Robert Repertory Theater here. Uh, and uh, good good for my name is Tim Culture Bot, and, and, and today box, we are uh, going to be talking with Robert Repertory. Uh, chewing the fat. Uh, chewing the fat? We sit here today I'll be chewing uh, the fat while you guys talk. We have waffles on this special Easter edition. If you have not received an Easter egg, we will have an Easter egg hunt at the end of the discussion. Uh, but first, I just want to give a little bit of an introduction if you are unfamiliar with our artists here today. Uh, I moved to, uh, to Austin five years ago from New York City. I was getting very tired of living there, and I sat down one day with uh, Lisa Diamore, and she said, when you move to Austin, get to know Ron Barry. You'll like him a lot. She I did. Yeah, she did. She did. She did. <laughs> and just check out the root mechanicals. And I said, great. When I got here, I started sitting down with a lot of theater artists and a lot of artists around town. One by one, people would kind of lean over a table and say, have you heard of Rebel? <laughs> <laughs> As if we're running guns to rebels or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> and uh, I thought the label, maybe rebels, is not exactly the worst label we could probably come up with the work that you do. Uh, they have absolutely no regard for the fourth wall, and absolutely, as far as I can tell, have no respect for reality. Uh, they are among the most exciting theater companies I have ever come across, and I see my fair share of theater companies. Uh, today we are going to be talking primarily about their latest work, a uh, biography of physical sensation, but to start us off, before we get there, we need to go back to their last show, of passing fancy. And Josh, would you like to talk just a little bit about that? I would love to, yeah. So the casket of passing fancy was probably by far the, the biggest and most logistically complex thing we've ever done, maybe that we ever will do. Uh, so the way the show worked is you, you went to, into this kind of elaborately decorated parlor room where you were greeted by this grand duchess. And it was an audience of 30 who would come to the show each night. And then the Duchess would offer these audience members uh, their choice of the, these 500 offers. And she'd read them one by one off of these ornate playing cards. Um, they were things like, who wants to watch a Lincoln Douglas debate performed by two homeschool sisters? <laughs> who wants a ride to the border leaving now? Who wants, who wants a leeching? Who wants the, their wallet's worth of cash in pennies? Um, any favorites you want to throw? Uh, who wants to quit smoking, extinguishing your last cigarette on a man's hand? Uh, who wants to get in a car accident? We were trying to kind of find like anything someone could possibly want and kind of all of life contained in these 500 offers. And so as an audience member, during the show you got to choose one of these offers. When one appealed to you and it was what you wanted, you raise your hand and you were escorted out of the space and then one of the Duchess's 10 household domestics would give you this experience in one of kind of seven themed rooms that were in the same building or maybe somewhere off premises entirely. And, and another important thing is that each of these 500 offers could only be taken one time during the run of the entire show. So once, once it was accepted by an audience member, it was eliminated from the show forever. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so just the logistical complexity of preparing to have all 500 of these performative experiences ready to go on the first night. Like, I think we figured out at one time if we would you know, perform each of these 500 things in front of an audience in like one sitting, it would take over 100 hours. It was that much material. And so by the end of the run, there were like 76 offers that were not taken at all, that were just left over and that will never be performed. But the thing that we really liked about the show and that, that people gave us great feedback about is that, you know, despite being a show kind of about individual experiences, it ended up bringing people together in a really collective way because people would stay afterwards and, and they really felt the need to share with each other what they experienced. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a really wonderful uh, component to it. And it, it, this show, like, spread, like, like I was doing some, uh, I was officing at this multimedia education company and, like, I, IT guys would come up to me and be like, have you heard about this thing that's going on? <laughs> they have these experiences that you can go to. Like, these are people that would 
never go see theater. Uh -huh. uh, have no idea what's going on in that sort of realm, but they were completely floored by this. I think that really spoke to the to the power of this piece. Uh, yeah. And so I guess you know the the, the creating a situation where people kind of had to stay and talk about it to each other afterwards is one of the things that led us into this next show. We wanted to see if there was a way we could give people an individual experience, but make something that was a little more self-contained. And so, with this show Biography of Physical Sensation that we're doing right now, we decided to take a kind of alternative approach to biography, which is, you know, it can be such a kind of cliche form in books and movies and theater. So we thought, what's a totally different way to experience someone's life? So we said, you know, let's do, let's experience someone's life entirely through sensory elements, taste, touches, smells, sounds, and let's perform these things on audience members. So, so this show, the audience sits in a circle, it's still a very limited audience, like 35 or 40, and there's three sizes of chairs you can choose from, small, medium, and large. And small chairs are people who want the least intense experiences, and then large chairs are people who want the most intense experiences, and then the show is kind of a montage of hundreds of sensations from one woman's life, Jamie Damon, 57-year-old woman we chose during the interviews of Fuse Blacks last year. How many people did you interview before this? You interviewed several people before you settled on Jamie's story, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it was roughly like 50 people, I think, showed up over like three days of interviews last year. And was she just that you were going to go with her immediately, or did, was there debate on which story you should go with? It was, it was a very hard decision. Like, we thought it'd be much more clear than it was, but so many of the people, like, almost everyone who came to the interviews was fascinating enough to have a show about their life. Um, we asked them to the first interviews, we asked them to bring their oldest article of clothing, something that smelled like them, and one or two other things, and we kind of had them tell their life story in like two minutes or less, and just a series of questions. And then we narrowed it down to three people or four people, and went to their homes for like a two and a half hour, much more intensive interview, and we kind of went through some of their things. And, but what really tipped us over with, with Jamie, other than being an absolutely fascinating person who's had a huge range of life experiences, and she's just so in touch with her sensory side, um, was that she, she's archived, archived her life so well. Like, she said, you know, if you choose me, tomorrow morning I will go to the storage unit and, and I will bring to your house like 10 giant boxes of diaries, letters, journals, photos, artwork, um, video recordings, audio recordings. And this was extra touching because she did not know us or our work at all. And I mean, she literally turned over everything, you know, Polaroids of her Giving child birth. being born and her like baby book from the hospital from the 50s and, you know. I, the night that I saw it was, I think, the opening night and she was there seeing it for the first time. I wasn't sure who she was, but I sort of picked her out. I kind of identified her and it was wonderful watching her. I mean, it was uh, just this, uh, it was like watching her life uh, in front of her eyes. And, uh, Really powerful to see that as well. I mean, she, she loved it. It was a great mood line, but that was also this really interesting uh, experience seeing the subject watching this, like, watching her own sort of life <laughs> yeah. in this very particular, unusual way. And, and I, I like having her come. She's come a few times now, and she's very tough on us. She'll pick out little details <laughs> and be like, no, 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 no. Like, we have, at one point, we have someone listening to a recording that has them move their head back and forth slowly and say, we're going to Nana's house. And that's like Jamie's mantra that she uses for relaxation since she was like seven years old until now. And we had the pronunciation of Nana slightly wrong. So that was a big mm -hmm. thing this last time. She's like, it's Nana. That is, you don't know how important that is to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw the show last October and then a couple of nights ago again. And uh, I am curious about your 
is how does it change from your first run to what's happening in GSM? Uh, we have two new technicians that have been swapped out, and a handful of sensations uh, have been revamped or exchanged for new sensations that we figured out since then. Things that were kind of failure sensations last time. <laughs> like, like what? Is that your uh, Bug in underpants is gone. Yeah, <laughs> a, a, uh, being, a, a being scared by Doberman's sensation. <laughs> that was like, wait, wait what's the thing that's gone? Explain the being scared by Doberman's sensation. <laughs> It was, something, it was something that we like never ever got to work the first round. Like we, we even changed it a few nights before we opened back in October, and it was still just uh, not quite there. Like it, it, it was in, initially like just being scared by these like large boom boxes with with dogs barking on them. But, but that, what's the story behind it? She oh, like, oh, oh, the actual life story. Yeah. Uh, she, what was like walking in like the the heat down the side of a highway and she was in her like 20s or or like like something kind of in the country yeah and like there, there was something like a pack of Dobermans wild dogs behind her and so she had this sort of long period of like walking down the road in this heat sort of walking like Frankenstein to try to not incite wow. these dogs but we've replaced that sensation with a uh Party at the garlic farm sensation, which seems to work better. <laughs> um, and what is the party at the garlic farm? <laughs> well, the way the sensation is created is you're giving a, a realistically weighted baby doll to hold, and a mask with garlic is over your face, like garlic smell, fresh garlic smell. And then there's Oh, you're blindfolded. There's the sound and smell of like sizzling campfire and a live fiddle tune is played also at the same time. It's kind of just recreating these. Um, Jamie kind of lived at this communal place in Arizona in I think the 70s. Yeah. And they just had these big outdoor parties with, with uh, on a garlic farm with babies and music and campfire. Question about the structure of the piece. How you, how you thought about the structure? How do you assemble these sensations? Yeah, it's largely random. Uh -huh. There's no. It's not linear through her yeah. life at all. Um, there's, you know, there's some, a little bit of a tint like. Sign kind of shaping the original yeah. randomness to yeah. certain things happening at the same time that seem to kind of like complement each other or make sense. And then I think in general it kind of it starts out brighter and then gets a little more intense and darker as it goes on. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, I mean I, I thought it was fascinating. It was just a, a I'd never seen I never looked at someone's life that way. Like it was like this fractal of their life, a hundred particles like being collided in this room, and you weren't sure what chapter of their life. Yeah. But, but creating these new sort of uh, connections. Uh -huh. you know, I just thought that was really, really fun. I mean, I'm sort of glad if, if it wasn't like a chronological. Yeah. Uh, you know. Anyway. Some people have said, uh, you know, each audience member probably gets three to five individual sensations performed on them during the. 75 minute show. And a lot of people tend to take all the sensations they've received and think those are a narrative that uh, are connected. Yeah. Totally. I was kidnapped and then I was tied up. And then <coughs> so. yeah. There's that sensation I remember. Um, the what? The, this piece is so reliant. You have 35 chairs. It's reliant on audience participation. Have you had trouble? What happens when you don't have 35 people there? Is it, do you cut anything at uh, the last minute, or do you ask people to do other things? Yeah, we have a system of you know where we can go down to like 29 people without kind of messing up the way we do it at all. Is if we just if there's 29 people and you go to a chair and it's empty, you go to the chair right to the left of it, and that'll work out with the sizes of chairs and everything, and that person will be available. But if it gets below that, it gets a little trickier. So we really have to push to have audience there. But we're used to doing it like 
when we rehearse, we'll do it for like five or six people, and they'll get all the sensations. Mm -hmm. Since we're used to working with less people, it's you know you can kind of work with it as long as you make sure that you know you know who has the food allergies in the room, and you know who definitely wants the large chair experiences and wants the small chair experiences. And it's almost like if those shows where we would do it for five or six people, or even our earlier rehearsals where we'd have one pe one person come and receive like three hours of sensations, it was kind of unbearably intense for some of those people, giving just one thing after another. I think it's important to have the time in the show to like yeah. watch and sit back. Otherwise, it's just constant surprises and things being done to you. And you can kind of, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Have you had problems with audience? Surprisingly rarely. Mm -hmm. um, I think since it's kind of self-selective, um, and we make it pretty clear what a small, medium, and large chair might entail, people want to do a good job in the show. And I think they, they also see it as kind of like an air, the large chair people, <laughs> so they're less likely to say no. Um, if anything, we've had people, a few people, come back afterwards, after the show, and say, you know, that was, that was a little, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that, you know? And sometimes sensations that have been pretty, received in a pretty benign way on most nights, but it will just trigger something very personal from someone's life that might not have anything to do with what the sensation was from Jimmy's life. And I think that that's an interesting thing about the show is it does become as much about your own life when you're experiencing it as, as Jamie's. test them a lot. It was a long development period and there were a group of maybe three guys and five women and we were bringing these things in and testing them on each other and, and vigorously debating whether you know we could do these on audience members and then we brought in people who didn't know us or know the show and tried it on them. And so it's been this whole process and we feel pretty, pretty good about what's in there even though it is uh, fairly transgressive for what you would expect to do in theater performance and just, you know, any kind of hurting audience members seems kind of crazy. Getting audience members, having them naked in the room is very surreal to be seen during the show. Um, generally, I think people embrace it and really go along for the ride and um, People approach it with a great sense of humor. They like to be kind of surprised by all this stuff. What? This is sort of a uh, maybe a, a larger, more general question. But what excites you about uh, theater or performance? Uh, what? Why are you working in this? Small question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make a specific kind of performance. Yeah, yeah. What, why are you choosing that over like film? What, what I guess what excites you about the the live experience? Well, 
we love, I mean, we're, we're not the most socially comfortable men. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of why we do our shows the way we do. We like to like really meet our audience and get to know them and make connections with them. And you know, most of our shows will run our own box office and greet people at the door and talk them after the show. It's just yeah, very that kind of experience. Right. Otherwise, it's just us hanging out together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. by that, I don't know how to pronounce their name, I think they're a Dutch group. Um, they're, they're two words, the first word starts with O, and the second word starts with is Goed, Anteroed, Goed, does anyone know? Um, so they did this show called The Smile Off, they, they have a trilogy of kind of participatory shows. They did this show called The Smile Off Your Face, where you went through it individually in a wheelchair, yes, yes. and all these absurd things happened to you. But their most recent show is kind of gets rid of a lot of the props and everything and operates with the audience on a totally like psychological fucking with them level. Um, it kind of uses speed dating as a launching point and each performer starts individually with an audience member and I guess makes these really strong connections with them but then everyone comes together in a circle and things are revealed and audience members are betrayed mm -hmm. and, and it kind of gets at like what we're willing to tell the complete strangers mm -hmm. and it's, it's caused very strong reactions yeah, in yeah. people when it's been performed. Mm -hmm. Has it been performed in the US? I don't think so, not yet. Um, and now they're doing, at some festivals they're doing all three of their shows in this kind of trilogy, oh. so I'd, I'd love to see them at Fuse Box. <laughs> You've been working on the show for, for a long time, uh, and I'm wondering what, what's next? You're probably the only, you have such a wide range of uh, things that interest you guys, and so many things that uh, you've done in the past, Wallace Shawn play, you've been on a cruise ship with What's next for you guys? Do you have any ideas on, on where you're going? We don't know what the next like big project is going to be. We know we're both going to take some time this next year and work on solo shows. Um, Matt's going to do a, a one-person opera he's already started on. Um, <laughs> 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 um, that's all we know. But I, you know, I want there to be at least be a third show in this kind of biography presentation, casket passing fancy, and something else. I'm not sure what it's going to be. Matt, can you tell us about the opera? I'll only say that, like, I don't really know how to read or write music, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that that's my like starting point. <laughs> I, I, I don't really read or write music or play any instruments. And he's not allowed to have any help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to get like coaching, um, so I'm just locking myself away. I just wanted to do an, an opera for a long time. Because <laughs> he, did, he did this one man, he did this solo dance that he, he's going to do at Fusebox tomorrow night, which was 20 minute solo dance, and he's, he had dance training. When I was a little, little boy. It's been a long time. So. I feel like the opera will go with his uh, ballet. And Yeah, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think that Austin is the second coolest town in the country. Now, the first coolest always depends on what's happening politically or artistically, but Austin will always be the second coolest town. The number one is always changing. And I think that you guys are definitely a key asset to why Austin is. You will always be a second. <laughs> always be. 
<laughs> number one, who cares? Always trains. You guys are fantastic. Uh, what I'm going to do is open it up to the audience. Do you guys have any questions or comments for these guys? I wonder if you guys ever, are you ever scared? Yeah, the, the question was whether we're ever scared during our performances. And I definitely am during uh, biography physical sensation because there's just a sense of having to take care of the 35 people in the room and so many unpredictable variables. So, you know, it can be pretty stressful. And yeah. There's like that general sense, and then also there are like a couple sensations that at this point haven't run the show for you know, 15 or 17 times that we just sort of know or have maybe have more potential to cause responses in people. Like, I, I have a couple things like that where I, I get a little a little bit nervous beforehand. What are those? Uh, the popcorn counter incident. Okay. Uh, mainly. Pop popcorn yeah. counter incident. Yeah, there, there, there's a sensation in the show that uh, we've gotten some negative response to and it's uh what is it from her life uh from from jamie's life she was working at this um sort of juvenile detention center and uh she worked in like the, for some reason this center had like a, a concessions counter with, like a glass booth and she was selling candy and popcorn there and someone reached through the glass uh like like the whole slot and grabbed her hair and like pulled her head against the uh counter like that. So uh, we have a sensation in the, in, in the show that, 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 sort of, that sort of recreates that complete smell of popcorn. And uh, it's one of the most just directly violent. Yeah, sensations. and it's one where like, you really just don't know what's coming. So there's, there's not a chance to say no, really. It's like happened before you. Uh, yeah. So, and like depending on, on who's in that seat, too. Like, and Kirk Lynn uh, from the Room Mexer see the sensation, and what he thought was interesting about it was that it happened so quickly that none of the o other audience members even notice it's happened to you, so you don't even get any kind of recognition for going through it. Do, do, do you remember what that sensation was? Where it is? Or, yeah, what which one Kirk was talking about. Oh, well, that, that's the pop one. Yeah. Oh, the, the yeah. pop one. Right, right. yeah. I, do, I do feel like this sense of of danger is like a wonderful and essential component to the work, at least from, um, as I have experienced it. And I, I feel like it's so rare to experience a sense of danger when you go to the theater. And not that in this case, sometimes it's actual danger, but I mean, just, I just even just feel like in terms of storytelling, I feel like often the, the theater going experience is very safe, you know? And, and so I feel like just in terms of Storytellers, whether whether it's abstract, non-linear uh, stories or more linear stories, just it's. I feel like often the form, the way the form is being considered, uh, is getting in the way of of uh, creating an exciting, active sort of place. You know, and I feel like that's something that you guys really, really succeed at. You know, it's creating a sense of uh, uh, danger and electricity. You know, it's very aligned. It's very it's something you could not do in any other art form. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very much a live experience. So, anyway. And I'd be curious, now I'm really questioning why we keep wanting to throw danger in our theater these days. Like, why not do a show that is extraordinarily pleasant, extraordinarily blissful, beyond, maybe this is my next show, but, but so amazingly wonderful that, that that sort of heartbeat danger feeling that you get from their kind of shows, you know, I'm, I'm very curious to see the other effects. We're talking about that with, with Kirk, because after this show, Kirk said, you know, I, I like it, but I, I really want you to just do a show where I, I get hugs and five dollar bills. Yeah, that's, 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 I've been thinking about this a lot. Like, it's, there's something, like, I think that we're in this era of making theater where it's like, it's gotta be edgy, it's gotta be dangerous, it's gotta, punch you and hit you and slap you and you, that's how you feel. And I'm like, hmm, let's, let's, let's do something different. I guess, maybe, I, guess I should know? clarify, when I, when I use the word danger, I'm, I'm really talking about when the rules are unclear. Uh, 
you don't know what's going to happen. It doesn't have to be, it could be the most lovely experience in the world. I'm just saying that I feel like often when you go, the rule, everyone understands what's happening and it's boring right. and the space is dead because of that. I, I guess that's, and that's, danger is a, is a tricky word. Yeah. But, um, it's, to me, it's about creating an active space that is alive, activating the space. Can you tell me a little bit about how your process and how your partnership works? <laughs> it's so like deeply ingrained and codependent now. I don't know where do we start. Yeah, it's been um, Well, how do you start like a, a how do you do you meet and generate ideas or just happen when you're hanging out or um, I mean we're even when we're not working on a show, we're together a lot of the time. A lot of things begin in our favorite swimming pool in Austin. Um, yeah, things just bubble up. You know, we, we ask a lot of sort of like what if sort of sorts of questions. There's also a division of labor and things we each yeah. take through a lot more out. Matt has the unfortunate task that he took on of doing the props for the, the show. Which oh <laughs> laundry and groceries and tending to the frozen laundry. <laughs> <laughs> what my life is about anyway. <laughs> Other questions? I have a question. Like, so you guys have talked a little bit about your background. It's like how, the, how you got to developing these kind of shows. But like, where did you guys come from? Did you guys go to school? For theater, like did you, did you start out at other theater companies, other places, and then just end up here and start working together, or like, I guess, what are your origins? Yeah, where did we come from? Matt comes from Michigan. I come from Kansas, but we both went to school together at the University of Kansas. Started making some shows together there, and I was a year ahead of him, so I moved down here and said, "Oh, it's it's great down here. You should come down." And we've been here since 2002. And, and you guys were studying theater at school? Theater, we met on a production of Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> which we want to do someday. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see you guys do Oklahoma. Yeah, we can get the rights. The win would be awesome. Any other questions? In the biography of um, Physical Sensation, how many shows do you have left? Four or more, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, and it's playing at the offshoot right now. Uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Go to Peace Box Festival website and get tickets there. Uh, young, thank you for coming. Thank you so Matt's, much. Matt's doing a solo on Monday as well. Where? Uh, it is part of this Catch series, which is a bi-monthly performance series in Brooklyn. Uh, that Andrew Dinwiddie and Jeff Larson put together. And this is a, a special version of Catch that's combining Austin artists with New York artists. I think there's one or two from Minneapolis as well. Um, so, in, in, the, in the format is, is sort of short format. It's often either short works or works in progress. Um, uh, people are free to drink beer. It's a very casual, fun, sort of rowdy environment. Uh, and uh, it should be a really, really crazy fun time. And it's at the end. Who all is performing? You know? um, we'll be posting the lineup uh, online. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some surprises, some things that we can't actually announce. Wow. Oh. <laughs> uh, now we got to go. Thanks for coming, uh, and, and be sure and, and uh, check out the website for uh, a lot of the other uh, programming that's going on. There's uh, some amazing artists that are here visiting, so you get a chance to, to see the work and, and talk to the artists that are here.